Hello, everyone. This is Jay Alejandro with the Creative Drive Podcast, the short podcast to showcase and feature writers from all walks of life, no matter where they are in the world. And today we are so happy to bring you a flash memoir by Miriam Sagan. Miriam Sagan is a poet and writer. She founded and now runs the creative writing program at Santa Fe Community College. Miriam's most recent books are Map of the Lost from UNM Press and Seven Places in America from Sherman Asher. She is working on site-specific poetry installations. And you can find out more about Miriam at miriamswell.wordpress.com. And now a flash memoir from Miriam Sagan. Laban's born. My brother is born in the summer. Winter vacation, my dad takes me and my sister to California to visit his best friend's family. My mom stays home with the two littles. It's a lovely time. No snow, the smell of eucalyptus. My first time in Chinatown. A restaurant down a flight of steps recommended as the best. A giant fried butterfly shrimp. I buy some tiny cranes with wires for legs. You put them in a pot of moss and create a miniature garden. We go to Muir Woods where the redwood burrs bring forth green shoots and you can ship them home and put them in a bowl of water. Crossing the Golden Gate Bridge, I'm in the passenger seat. My dad is absentmindedly listening to the radio. They are talking about something weird a Nazi breeding program. I'm 10 years old. I know about sex. My ears are riveted. You have to have sex? They take you away and make you have sex with a stranger and have babies? Blonde Nazi babies? Super race doesn't mean a lot to me, and I don't understand the word Lebensborn. But I understand. Suddenly, my father reaches over and changes the station to classical music. Still, I feel soiled. I can't ask my dad because it is about sex. He is informative about Nazis, but for the combo, I need my mother. Flying home, our plane gets grounded in a storm in the middle of the country. We are put on a bus and drive all night through raging snow. We stop at a diner and my father encourages me to order a hot roast beef sandwich with gravy. You'll like it, he says. I do. For many years, it will be my favorite thing to order. There is a handsome young British guy with a guitar on the bus. He is nice to me and my sister. Years later, my dad says, Remember that guy with the guitar on the bus, traveling all over? Turns out there were a lot more to come. Hippies. Towards the end of the trip, the driver is disoriented and my dad directs him through Pennsylvania and New Jersey. My dad has the map in his head. You had a good time? My mother asks. I had a really good time, but... Mom, I say, did the Nazis make people have sex so they could have perfect Nazi babies? Yes, she says. That is all, but it is enough. Avrum. My mother's mother dies, and my grandfather Avrum comes to live with us. He is short and wrinkled and covered in scars. Most of these are from surgery, but between his eyes he has a crescent moon from when a cow kicked him. As a boy, he was trying to ride the cow. The Tsar did not like me personally, my grandfather says. So I came to America. In Russia, I turned the other cheek, and they hit the other cheek, too. So I came. I adore him, although he is bad-tempered and apt to yell at us when we are talking too much at the supper table. He yells, inhales a piece of raw carrot, begins to choke, and rushes from the table to get a glass of water. He survives and goes on to give advice. I'll be your guru, he tells me. It's the late 60s, and even the Beatles have a guru. My grandfather loves subgum chicken with almonds and all kinds of Chinese food. He saves nails and string in glass jars. Actually, he does not have much real advice for me. 
He doesn't tell me how to live or what to do. He models something by eating eggs and bacon, smoking mentholated cigarettes, and drinking schnapps every day. Look at the moon, he tells me. That's not the real moon. It is a moon-sized replica of the moon in the sky. The Russians have the real moon in the basement of the Kremlin. He dies when I am 13, and I will always miss him. I play an odd game of pretend. What if he had been born, presumably to me, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, been raised in hippie Santa Fe, and gone to Little Earth School? been in a band and had lots of sex and eaten psychedelic mushrooms in the Arroyo, maybe studied technical theater or been an architect, worn loud shirts and gone through a motorcycle phase. Would he have been happier backpacking in Europe rather than running from Cossacks? Less angry if he'd had sushi and YouTube? I can't know, but keep imagining. Pandemic. Everyone is sick, feverish, vomiting. The six of us. It's 1968, so my grandfather Avrum, who lived with us, is already dead. He had a tremor, Parkinsonian souvenir of the 1918 flu. His mother died in childbirth with him. I don't know her name and never will. My world is a rough one may be rougher than it will be when I grow up. We are tested for TB because Avrum had TB in his liver of all places. I love him and when he moves in with us, I spend my evenings worrying that he will die. At night, I sneak in to watch his breathing asleep in front of the television. But he's dead by 1968 as we and millions of Americans go down with the so-called Hong Kong flu. We recover slowly, but although the Christmas vacation is over, school is still closed. My mother does not go back to work, and we stay home, getting on each other's nerves. Winter is my father's slow season, and I see in retrospect that being cooped up with us is his idea of hell. So he takes us to the Plaza Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. It is a delightful choice, unlimited room service just a dial away. The family business is booming madly at the end of the 60s, although later it will go belly up. My father is feeling flush. At times, in his role as patriarch, my father will ban certain items as too extravagant. No orange juice or shrimp cocktail in restaurants. But now... Fatigued from his personal corner of the pandemic, we can order whatever we like. Which we do. And cruise the corners of the hotel as if we are Eloise. Pop out and hail a taxi, never realizing we are supposed to tip the doorman who increasingly scowls at us. Jump on beds, play cards at all hours, watch unlimited television, strictly controlled at home. And write our friends letters on hotel stationery. Now, memory fails me, but life must have returned to normal. What did I learn from my father? I had already learned that a good time, dinner, a trip, a festive holiday, could turn bad through one of his rages. But I also learned that a bad thing, a pandemic with vomiting, could turn to fun. In many ways, my father was my first and ongoing introduction to the complexity of human reality.